هي از ذا نيورو سبيشالست ان اس جي اتش مدينه تفضل دكتور محمد Greetings to our audience from different parts of the world. I am pleased to join that uh, webinar with the great and the eminent staff in the stroke uh, field. Today we have eminent speakers from different parts of the world. We have Professor Helmut Stein Max, Head of Neurology Department, Frankfurt University, and Professor Dr. Ashfaq Shoaib, Director of Stroke Program, University of Alberta, Canada, and our eminent professor. Professor Dr. Hani Arif, Head of Neurology Department, Ain Shams University. When we think about the title of our International Stroke Webinar, it was time to tame. Time because it is a great challenge for all stroke doctors, how to catch stroke patient in the exact time and suitable time to save his life, save him from disability. Stroke considered as the second leading cause of death in the world. And according to WHO estimation, every year about 15 million people have a stroke. 5 million of them die, and 5 million of them left with disability. That's why we choose the time. Tame stroke is a wild monster, and the taming is to making wild animals more domestic and easy deal to us. You know, all neurology doctors, with every minute pass, we lost 2 million neurons and 14 billion synapses and 12 kilometers of axonal fibers. That's why the title of our talk, I am to team. Let's start with our eminent speaker, Professor Dr. Helmut Steinmetz. He will give us a hot lecture about preventive measures of a stroke, antiplatelets, and the static. You can start, Professor Dr. Hale. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, before I start my talk, let me thank you for this um, endeavor of tonight. Uh, and I'm very proud and glad to be part of this panel. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks. My name is Helmut Steinmetz. I'm professor of neurology, talking, speaking from Frankfurt in Germany. Um, and when you asked me, Dr. Mohammed, about four weeks ago, uh, whether I was willing to be part of this tonight, um, I thought, well, maybe I will talk to 20 people or so in, in, in Medina, but um, now it appear apparently are much more people um, than I thought originally, which makes me nervous a little bit, but um, I'll try my very best. And when you asked me what, what title I uh, would propose for my talk, I was a little bit hesitant, but then I, uh, I thought, I'll let me talk about prevention because um, there have been some interesting new aspects in prevention in the last 18 months that I talk, will talk about now. Uh, I mean, th there's, there's a little bit less glory in prevention than in intervention, but I tell you, um, as you know, uh, you can save much more brain tissue by prevention than by intervention. So I'll try to explain why and now open up my talk one moment. I hope you see it now. Do you also see my pointer? Yes. Okay, fine. So that's the title of my talk, 2020 Update on Vascular um, Prevention. And those are the three classical topics of prevention that I will talk about. Um, blood pressure management, antiplatelet drugs, and lipid lowering. And uh, I will restrict myself to interesting new studies and articles of the last 80, 18 months. Now, starting with blood pressure. Now, as you all know, bl blood pressure treatment or lowering um, prevents vascular events of all kinds and vascular death. Um, but one interesting thing was were certain, several articles about cognition um, in relation to antihypertensive treatment. Now one is this study um, appearing in August 2019 in the Journal of the American Medical Association from the ARIC study. That, that's a very large study of about 15,000 people community-based um, United States, 
And they, it, it, the study is going on since decades. As you see here, visit one of 15,000 people uh, at the age of four, 54 plus minus six was in the late 80s of the last um, century. Um, visit two was, was a couple of years later, visit three, visit four. And now um, we're in the late life visit stage of this study, uh, reporting some interesting outcomes that I will show you. Now, people who had two visits in midlife with hypertensive blood pressure measurements, meaning 140 or more systolic, um, were termed hypertension at midlife. Those are the two upper lines here. Uh, and you see that um, in 20 to 30 years later, in their late life, those who had hypertension during midlife are much more likely to be uh, cognitive declined or demented in, the, in their late life. That's figures of almost 20% in those who had hypertension during midlife and hypotension during late life and about 12, 13% having had hypertension during midlife and hi remain hypertensive also in late life. Those who were normal tensive in midlife had much lesser numbers, almost half. So let's say five to 7% um, were demented in late life. Now that's interesting in several respects um, because it confirms that blood pressure or hypertension during midlife is a risk factor for late life dementia. It also opens some questions why those who have had hypertension in midlife and developed to have hypotension in late life are even worse than those with ever hypertension. Interesting thing. Maybe it's due to one hypothesis could be over treatment of blood pressure, making people demented. That's one hypothesis. The others is those who develop cardiac failure in late life, partly due to hypertension, decline even more than those who stay hypertensive throughout uh, all life stages. So interesting thing, epidemiologically confirming uh, hypertension as a strong risk factor for later dementia. Uh, of course, this is not prevention, it's epidemiology. And the big question now is, can we prevent this by treating blood pressure during midlife if the person is hypertensive? And there have been two interesting studies in the last um, two years that I'm proceeding to now. One is this one. It's the Sprint Mind study that was published in, uh, in the JAMA also in, in 2019. Um, for those who are not familiar with that, let me explain. Sprint is a study um, mainly concerned with vascular endpoints. Um, it was a study comparing standard treatment of blood pressure meaning 140, lower than 140 um, versus uh, intensive treatment of blood pressure with targets less than 120 in people with blood elevated blood pressure plus other risk factors except diabetes. That was the SPRINT study that was terminated um, a, a couple of years ago and published in the New England Journal 2015 because it was positive for the vascular endpoints for intensive blood pressure lowering, meaning targets less than 120. Study was terminated. But now, five years later, we uh, have witnessed this paper here uh, because five years later, they now come with the cognitive endpoints, which were also included. But of course, the cognitive endpoints always take longer uh, than the vascular endpoints to be statistically relevant. And now let us see what they found five years after termination of the sprint study with the vascular endpoints, you find the following thing. This was the trial phase, two years of intensive versus standard treatment of blood pressure. Um, after that, the trial was stopped. Interestingly, uh, the blood pressure values in both arms of the study converged, uh, that's so the, the lower ones. Um, got nearer to the higher ones. But nevertheless, even five years after um, stopping tri the trial, um, the standard treatment, less than 140, compared to the intensive treatment arm, um, has a trend, not statistically significant, but has a trend towards considerably higher 
um, incidence of cognitive decline. So uh, this study was not um, statistically significant, but it shows a trend. And uh, this is interesting in terms of what I will show you next, but it's also interesting in terms of uh, what many people um, are, are f f or at least patients fear that intensive lowering of blood, of blood pressure may make you sick. Uh, because if anything is in here, then the trend is the opposite. So that intensive lowering below 100, 120 saves brain tissue. But of course, as always, if a study is underpowered, that's the conclusion by the authors, um, systolic pressure goal of less than 120 compared with less than 140 did not result in a significant reduction in the risk of probable dementia because of early study termination, as mentioned, and fewer than expected cases of dementia, the study may have been underpowered for this endpoint. Interestingly, there have been other studies in the, in the past, PROGRESS, for instance, published 2003, uh, which had a similar trend without becoming significant. And that's, of course, as always, if several studies are underpowered, that's the hour of a meta-analysis. And this came up just a couple of weeks ago, uh, again in the, in the JAMA. Um, it's a study um, of now including 14 randomized controlled trials of anti-hypertensive anti treatment, also including cognitive endpoints in the long run. Uh, and they have not less than 95 included uh, 95,000 participants in these 14 trials, which were now meta-analyzed, uh, um, in uh, including the individual patient data. And that's interesting. I'll show you the studies. You see, those are the studies. I will not read them, but progress is included. Huh? This is studies comparing antihypertensive treatment with placebo. That was possible in the early ages, uh, early years, um, or alternative treatments of uh, hypertension or higher blood pressure targets. So 14 um, reports of antihypertensive treatment, including cognitive endpoints, meta-analyzed in this recent study. And to make a long study uh, story short, you see here the absolute risk reduction is 0.39%. I mean, OK, that's not much. Um, there are odds ratio is an 0.93, that's also not much. I mean, it's a reduction um, by 7% of the likelihood of dementia in, in later life. Uh, but I mean, it's a significant finding and it's a finding in a condition where unfortunately we still have no other treatment. So that underscores, as I think, the relevance of treating high blood pressure in um, midlife and during all life uh, stages because you uh, prevent later life dementia after five plus up to 20, 30 years as shown here. Another interesting thing of this study is shown here. Uh, again, similar to the sprint mind results, those who had the, 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 the mar most marked drop in blood pressure due to medication uh, tended to fare better than those who responded less well to treatment. So again, um, intensive lowering of elevated blood pressure is not harmful. It appears in the, on the opposite, it appears to be beneficial uh, as again shown here, comparable to the sprint mind study. So to summarize this first third of my talk um, concerning blood pressure management, antihypertensive treatment reduces the incidence of later life dementia. Um, and this is the second big effect, um, adding to the vascular effects that we know, that we already know since many years. So you prevent um, co cognitive decline and vascular events of all kinds by intensive, and don't, don't worry about the possible negative side effects of too intensive lowering, uh, according to these studies, they're not very relevant. Now, next thing is antiplatelets. There has, you may think, well, that's boring, that's, that's all known, but there was an interesting um, study quite recently, which I will come to in a moment. Many of you may 
think from time to time, well, is it better to give the patient clopidogrel? Is it better to give him Tika Grelor? Um, companies um, keep on telling you that. And um, many of you may ask yourself, well, well, what are the studies all about um, comparing aspirin with these newer uh, P2Y inhibitors, as I show them? And this was an interesting meta-analysis just a couple of weeks ago um, in The Lancet comparing um, aspirin with the P2Y inhibitors. I, for those who are not familiar with this uh, expression, that's T Ticlopidin, uh, which is not no longer available. Uh, it's clopidogrel and it's ticagrelor. So three, all of those are the group of P2Y12 inhibitors. And um, they were um, studied in this meta-analysis in May, last May in The Lancet. And I'll show you uh, some of the results. Um, now it's the endpoint all cause death. Those are the studies. Um, which went into this meta-analysis. To make a long story short, no difference between um, aspirin and the P2Y inhibitors regarding all-cause death. Next endpoint, vascular death. Uh, again, no difference. The forest plots show you that. I will not go into further detail. Next endpoint, stroke. Especially interesting for the audience of today. Um, again, no difference, no difference between aspirin and the group of the P2Y inhibitors. The only marginal significance turned out to be to concern myocardial infarction. So it's a secondary prevention study. The patients had vascular events and then were uh, studied. So you need, um, if, you, if you prefer clopidogrel or ticagrelo over aspirin, um, with regard to the aim of preventing myocardial infarction, you will have to treat 244 patients in order to save one more than with aspirin alone. So uh, even in the paper, the authors concluded that this is a debatable, uh, of debatable relevance, given the lack of any other effect, and of course the availability argument um, favoring aspirin in all countries all over the world. So uh, interesting antiplatelets, um, not superior to aspirin. And there's also no difference. This is uh, another plot, one just regarding vascular deaths, but, but also concerning the other endpoint, stroke, myocardial infarction. There, there was no uh, difference between ticlopidin, clopidogrel, or ticagrelor in uh, the studies that studied these drugs. So it's also, so the conclusion is very simple. If you stick to monotherapy, of course, double antiplatelet treatment is something else. But if you uh, if you treat your patient with um, antiplatelet monotherapy, there's no argument except for maybe uh, intolerance um, to prefer any other drug over aspirin. So that's the second third of my talk. Um, now I'm move, moving to the last. Um, that's lipid lowering. Um, as many of you will know, um, there has only been one study um, recruiting patients after TIA or stroke um, and looking of the effect of statins on preventing um, secondary uh, recurrent stroke or other vascular events. That was the Sparkle study. That's a, that's a couple of years ago. Many of many of uh, Many in the audience will not even remember that uh, because it's 20 years or so ago, was published in the England Journal. That's the only study has been, I must tell you, because I will show you another one in, in a moment, has been the only study so far um, studying the effect of statin treatment after a neurovascular inclusion event. Um, and this study did not look for LDL targets. It just gave 80 milligrams of atorvastatin to all patients included, 80 milligram for all, um, without considering LDL targets. And um, of course, many physicians and many patients in particular do not like 80 milligrams of atorvastatin and nobody knows whether it's really necessary to take that high amount of, um, of, of dose of this drug. And, in the, at the beginning of this year, there was uh, an interesting study regarding this 
um, published in the New England Journal by Pierre Amarenko, who's, who's in this business since many, many years, the Treat Stroke to Target trial, uh, including almost 3,000 uh, patients after a TIA or stroke. Uh, and here you see here the two groups. It's the and they were treated um, with a, with a statin, but not a fixed milligram dose, but LDL target. The lower target was below 70, so let's say a cardiological target. The higher was the more traditional neuro, neurological target, not um, well um, supported by any study. It's just a neurological tradition uh, to say, well, let's target 100 milligram per deciliter as, a, as our statin uh, LDL target with statin treatment in neurology. So this was 90 to 110 was the high LDL target and below 70 was the low LDL target for these neurovascular um, group of the, almost 3000 patients. You see here that the target was well reached in both groups, higher target up here. Here's the milligram per deciliter LDL through the study period down here. And the lower target, also the lower target group reached the goal of lowering them to 70 or maybe around 70. Um, the treating physicians could use a statin of their choice. So there was no fixed statin. Um, and if they did not reach the target, the LDL target, they had to add acetamib, which was necessary in a third of the study population to, lead, to reach the target in both groups. So a third had statin plus acetamib. And now you see uh, the interesting finding uh, shown here. You get after five, uh, after seven years of, of, of the study, sorry, uh, eight years of the study, you get uh, a hazard ratio of 0.78. So you prevent, let's say, around 20% of, event, of events of um, combined endpoints of including stroke, myocardial infarction, vascular interventions of any kind or vascular death. So pre you prevent 20% of them approximately after eight years by treating the patient with a more intense and the, the lower LDL target of below 70. So that's, the, that's a cardiological result, I would say, but the first in neurology. And after that, at least in my department, and I guess in, in many guidelines that will come, we have now um, changed the LDL goal of neurovascular statin treatment um, to 70 milligram per liter. Two concerns. Um, that have been around regarding statin and intensive statin treatment is intracranial hemorrhages. And um, in this study, 18 in the low target group, 13 in the high target group, um, it was not significant. The other concern um, stemming from the Sparkle study also, there was a trend, uh, increased incidence of diabetes with uh, the lower target, but this again was not statistically significant, far from being statistically significant. So um, regarding the data available, there's no reason to worry about diabetes or intracranial hemorrhages as an argument against statins or high statin dosage. Summary um, of this third part of my talk is uh, that we have switched to a new LDL target and secondary prevention after TI or stroke. Um, that is below, treat your patient to reach below 70 milligram per deciliter LDL value. So this is my, this is the end of my talk. I hope I could give you some, um, some new information uh, regarding blood pressure, treat it and treat it as low as you can to prevent vascular uh, events and late life dementia. Um, stick to aspirin. There's no reason to switch unless the patient doesn't, um, doesn't re tolerate aspirin. And uh, lower the lipids, the, the LDL target in patients with atherosclerosis um, to below 70 if possible. Thank you and I'm happy to receive questions in the further run of our webinar. Thank you very much for listening.
thanks a lot, uh, Professor Dr. Helmut, for that interesting talk. And for all our audience, we can add the questions by hitting the icon of question and answer at the task bar at the end of our webinar, after finishing the talk of all our speakers, and we will answer all questions and discuss it with you. Now we will move to Professor Dr. Ashfaq Shoaib, Stroke Director of the program at University of Alberta, Canada. He will speak to us, speak to us about interesting hot topic. So back to me or some policies uh, and acute stroke. It's imaging more than important than time. Uh, we will see the answer with Professor Dr. Ashfaq now. You can start. Good morning. Um, and I'd also like to thank you uh, for the kind invitation. I would have preferred to be in Medina right now, but I'm not. So I'll have to do with my cold uh, weather in Alberta, but I'm very grateful to the organizing committee. I hope um, you can see my slides. Yes. And uh, here's my topic and uh, we'll move from prevention to acute stroke. The nice thing about uh, uh, Mohammed asking me to pick up my own uh, uh, topic was that I could pick something up that uh, is a bit easy because it's my day-to-day -day practice here. So I have no conflicts. Uh, and this is what I wanted to talk about. I, I wanted to just give you a flavor of what reperfusion therapy is and how we've done a, over the last uh, 30 years, get into the guidelines and then spend most of my time on what we do right now. As I was uh, listening to uh, Professor Steinmetz, um, I had my, you know, my cell phone with me and we are just now, it's, it's about uh, 9, 9.30 here right now. So we, we just had a patient from overnight who uh, had their imaging done. So we don't know the time of onset of the stroke, but we will be treating them based on what the imaging shows us. So the imaging is really important and, 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 and I, um, I do want to make sure that all my colleagues who are listening in to remember that it's not the same if you have good collaterals, you can go on for two or three days with very slow progressors, right? So then I'll end up uh, into what my recommendations are. So first of all, this is the classic we graph that looks at the percentage of patients. Doctor, I'm get... sorry for interruption. The presentation is not in the full screen in the mood. Oh, Okay, that is how I'm going to yeah, figure yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, thank are you. We, are we good now? Yeah, do, yeah do, thank you very much. Thank you, bro. All right. So let me at least move it here. That's better. So years ago, I, I was in Washington, D.C. in those days, and we were skeptics as everyone else. So this is all comers who came in under three hours. They were into two groups. 90 minutes and three hours, and half the patients got treated with TPA and the other half did not. For the audience who may not know, these modified rank and score scales that go from a zero, which is full recovery, so this is zero and one, which is full to nearly full recovery. Um, and as your um, score increases, it goes all the way up to death rate. So in here, when you compare the placebo to patients who got TPA, you can see there's an absolute difference of 11%. That's a big difference. So in, in most cardiology trials, a 2% or a 3% difference is considered to be a very big difference. So this is a big deal, but it took a long time to move this into clinical practice because most of us who are physicians um, and neurologists were not used to doing things very fast. What we also found out, and a lot of emphasis used to be on the treatment, the earlier you treat, the better it is. So if you treat it within the first 90 minutes, which was less than 5% of patients, the number needed to treat was 4.5. So in other words, if you treated five patients, one would make a full recovery. But if you went up to three hours, this number went up to nine, and up to four and a half hours, it went up to 14. So you had to treat 14 patients to get one good recovery. 
this area, the golden hour, was not known because there just weren't enough patients in here. And we got the, those patients into what's called the get with the get uh, uh, guidelines in, in the US, which is more than 65,000 patients. When they reported their findings a few years ago, they showed that a very small number of patients were in, in here. So 1.3% were under 60 minutes. But in those patients, your number needed to treat was literally one in three or one, well, one in 2.5. So if you could go in earlier, the better it was. But that's very really difficult. You can't just rely on these 1.5% of patients, right? So in here at the same time, what was happening was that technology was improving. We were going out from plain CT scans to, um, to CT angios and other imaging, as, I, and as I'll show to you. Um, okay, so um, that led to, let me just see if I can improve this in here. I, I, am I still okay with my slides? Am I good? Okay, so that, no, no, doctor, it's the same as before. Okay, so I just have to uh, go down. So th these were six studies. Uh, Escape was the one we worked in, but all these studies had a simple question: you have a good scan, you have an arterial occlusion, and you go in and use some device that can open it up very quickly. All these studies, every single one of them. So here's a Mr. Clean, that was the first one from Holland. And then uh, these four additional studies clearly showed that if you look at the modified Rankin scale, you can see that those who did not receive thrombectomy uh, are in red versus those who received thrombectomy. There was a clear absolute difference that approached 10 to 15%. The other thing that you may notice in here that's also very interesting is that as time went by, you could literally see that those who were in the Dr. control Dr. Sorry, for interruption another time. We didn't see the, the presentation is not on the slide. Oh, I, it's not on the slide. Can, um, can you help me with that? Because if I bring yeah. them up, are yeah. we good? It's not, no, it's, it's, it's not in the full, full screen. How do I improve keep, that? Keep it like this. It's okay, Dr. Okay. So there was both an improvement over time in those who were uh, getting the treatment benefit, but also those who weren't. And this is very intriguing, right? This basically spoke to better patient selection. And the patient selection was better because your imaging was getting better. So let's look at ESCAPE, which was our study, and look at what benefit we received. So here's your control group and here's your intervention group. And you're looking at modified rank and scales of two in them. And you can see that there's an absolute improvement of 23% who got treated. Now, when you compare this to, and, and, and make it, to, um, and simplify it, you can see that those who were on the medical treatment, no endovascular treatment, 25% of them had a positive outcome compared to 53% who got endovascular treatment. Also, the death in these patients went down from 19% to about 10%. So the treatment was clearly effective. Now, what that led to was these uh, uh, imaging advances um, that I want to talk about, but before we talk about the imaging advances, these are the most recent recommendations that we have for treatment. First of all, if you're going to use TPA in your hospitals, you need to have a protocol in place. You also need to have a designated stroke team. And if you're going to use TPA, at least 50% of your patients, in our center it approaches 80%, should have their treatment done within 60 minutes. This is for your intravenous TPA guidelines. For intra-arterial, based on those studies, the five studies I mentioned, the window was up to eight hours, but then diffuse and dawn came, and I'm going to come back to them in a minute. But in all these patients, you need to have clear evidence that there was an arterial occlusion and the brain tissue looked very good. 
Now that's where some of the problem came in because looking at a CT scan, uh, even in our center, when we've been using the aspects for, for ages, even our neuroradiologists sometimes disagree whether it's a good scan or not a good scan. So imaging became very important. Here's our um, e ER CT scanner. And I've put this in here for you that the treatment really starts here. So if somebody is coming with an acute stroke, you do your CT scan and there's no hemorrhage and this is under four and a half hour, you start with IVTPA. As the IVTPA is running, you do a CT uh, angiogram to see if there's an arterial occlusion, a mechanism, and an arterial uh, occlusion distally in the MCA. We always monitor our door to needle times. And as you can see, we maintain it month by month and we want to keep it around 40 minutes. This is really important for you. It takes about 10 minutes to do all this imaging completed. Now what this does, especially what this does for you, intracranial angi angiography, is that it puts these patients into three categories based on how good their collaterals are. If they have poor collaterals, and you can see that almost there's nothing out there, these patients are not going to do well no matter what you do, as opposed to intermediate collaterals and very good collaterals. These are the kind of collaterals that you'd like to have. The problem in here is that you eyeball these. I mean, there, there are more than 10 different uh, classifications of for quantifying them, and the more the, the, the classification, the more difficult it, it usually, it indicates it's much more difficult to classify them well. So these patients are not going to do well, and these would hopefully do well, even if you did not treat them. So this is 24 hours later, you can see that there's a very large MCA infarct where the collaterals were poor, but if you compare the other two groups, and you can see them, them I mean, in, in our practice, about 15, 20% of patients would have excellent collaterals they will have a very small clinical deficit and the radiologist would be wondering, you know, should I go in and open the vessel up or not, right? Um, so, so, so that's what we do routinely, but th this, wasn't, this wasn't ideal. So what, what came in uh, more recently, and that's why my presentation today was the whole concept of CT perfusion imaging. And I'll encourage you those of you who want to treat these patients in the distant uh, window, time windows, that you should consider uh, more and more of uh, CT perfusion. There are many softwares available. The one that we use is Rapid, where the uh, purple indicates the core and the penumbra is the green. And I'll give you two, two quick examples in here of patients that we'd included into our, into our trial. Um, the escape trial. This is a gentleman who was 71 years old who came in five years, uh, five and a half hours into the stroke. There is an occlusion. There are good collaterals. Their imaging shows that there's a very large area of, co uh, of, of penumbra and very small core. And if you treat them seven and a half hours later, the vessels open up 24 hours later, their NIHSS has come down to uh, two and they're fully, more or less fully recovered with very little injury. Here's another example of a patient who's at one and a half hours, very poor collaterals, hardly any collaterals. And even at one and a half hour, they've got a fairly large established stroke. And these patients, when you open the vessel up, there's a hemorrhagic transformation and there's hardly any recovery. So uh, once this, um, this, uh, this uh, CT perfusion became available and you could better classify and pick up your patients, colleagues of ours in Stanford and um, Pittsburgh and, and, and also in Atlanta started looking at these imaging to better select patients. Most of you are aware of the thrombectomy trials between six and 24 hours, the so-called DAWN investigators. They were using CT perfusion, the rapid technology, and wanted to show that the core had to be very small, the core had to be small, and there had to be a big penumbra. And they clearly showed that if you do that, you can open those vessels up. There's a very small, um, uh, those in whom the uh, core, uh, the uh, procedure is not used have a very small number of patients who make a recovery versus those who have thrombectomy. And in here, the absolute difference was 35 with number needed to treat approaching three. This is the data from the 
uh, from the Dawn study, and we, when you compare it to the diffuse protocol, again, they were using the same um, uh, uh, rapid technology, small core, large penumbra, and they also showed very nicely that those who get treated do very well compared to those who get medical treatment up to 24 hours with absolute differences of 28. So this has basically changed the way we manage stroke. And what we have done, uh, and, and what we have done since then is that every single patient who comes in is a candidate for thrombectomy. And if they don't have an occlusion, then of course you can use similar imaging, in this case, MR imaging, with, with the study called the wake up trial. And if they have a very small core, which, which is your uh, flare deficit compared to what's on diffusion, these patients also do ex exceedingly well. So those who got TPA treated overnight versus those who got um, a placebo, there was an absolute difference of 11% um, of, of in here. And so what have we done then? So we've used these imaging technologies to define whether they are slow progressors or fast progressors. I'm coming towards the end of my presentation here. So uh, how do we do that? So these patients come in, you get plain CT, you get CT angio, and you get CT perfusion. And you can then make sure uh, whether these are fast progressors or so slow progressors. The, the somewhat complicated way is, is what was shown in here which is uh, once you've done these uh, imaging techniques and also you've confirmed that there's an intra-arterial occlusion, there's good penumbral tissue, then you wanna make sure that these patients can get into your uh, uh, angio suite as fast as possible, certainly under 90 minutes from on, for, for the time they come to the hospital. One of the best data set was published by our colleagues from, uh, from the US that showed that now you could start looking at what's called a collateral clock as opposed to a time clock, because if you have good collaterals, then your tissue um, injury progresses much more slowly compared to those who have got bad collaterals. So poor collaterals, you are going to lose much more of your brain tissue at a rate as fast as 52 um, mils versus uh, less than one mil in those who have got good collaterals. So if I summarize this for you, this is how we see them. If you have good collaterals, they are slow progressors and their tissue injury over time goes very, very slowly. So whether you catch them at two hours or six hours or eight hours, they will still do well compared to those who got poor collaterals, then within the first few hours, you can see that the baseline tissue injury increases highly significantly. Let me show you one quick clue in here that helps define these patients if you have the rapid technology. It's called the hyperperfusion index ratio. So if you have a high uh, uh, hyperperfusion index ratio, which is out here, these are the fast progressors. On the other hand, if your hypoperfusion index ratio is low, and, and the software can do that, or if you want to do it yourself, you look at the Tmax 10 divided by Tmax 6, and that gives you this ratio. So a high ratio is bad, a low ratio is good, and I'm going to show you examples as I wrap it up. Here's a patient in our uh, uh, um, uh, a practice here from two weeks ago, very low core, very large penumbra. You look at their um, hypoperfusion index, it is less than 0.5, which is 0.3. These patients are going to do well. Compare this one to another patient seen at three and a half hours. Um, again, large penumbra, moderate size core, but if you look at their hyperperfusion index, it's now more than 0.6. And you can see that this tissue, which may not have injury, is going to proceed very fast. And again, from, from, last, from yesterday, we had this patient with a very moderate size core, very large, very large penumbra with a, a hyperperfusion index of 0.8. We took this patient within an hour and a half 
to the angiosphere and we could not save this tissue. So imaging is very, very important. Uh, defining slow progressives versus fast progressives is, is important. And we have treated patients 36 hours, 40 hours into their stroke, especially when they were slow progressives. So let me wrap it up now with um, the following recommendations. First of all, all patients within 4.5 hours who meet the criterion for thrombolysis should be candidate. And in these patients, you don't require any sophisticated imaging when you start your treatment. Patients who've got large vessel occlusion under 4.5 hours, they should also proceed immediately to thrombectomy. Perfusion imaging is not necessary, but can be helpful. In patients who are beyond 4.5 hours, you need to define whether they are slow progressors or fast progressors. And if they are slow progressors, they will do very well if you do thrombectomy. And the way you define that is if there's a slow, if there's a small core and a large penumbra, especially if the person presents to your hospital within you know, a, a time period of between eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, those by definition are going to be slow progressors. In these group of patients, I would encourage you to use CT perfusion and CT um, uh, imaging much more liberally. So I'm going to stop here and we'll hope um, that there's some questions generated later on. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Dr. Ashfaq, for that uh, interesting presentation and uh, a lot of debates about uh, time and the rule of brain imaging. I think we got uh, answers for some of that uh, debates. And uh, now we are moving to uh, Professor Dr. Hani Arif, uh, head of the department at the Enchamps University. Professor Dr. Hani, in addition to his uh, field of interest, in stroke medicine and research, he focuses uh, his activities uh, in developing strategies and uh, policies, uh, logistics uh, to develop the field of stroke service in Egypt. And uh, he will give us a talk about Egyptian experience uh, regarding stroke logistics, uh, policies, and strategies in order to reduce uh, the burden of stroke disease in uh, Egypt. Welcome, Dr. Hania, and you can. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Mohammed Fouad, and uh, I also would like to thank uh, the Saudi German group for inviting me uh, to be among these uh, two eminent stars of stroke. It's a gr great honor for me. Uh, it's, it's rather a uh, story rather than a, um, a regular presentation the story of how in the last few years we managed to improve stroke service in Egypt uh, in a very short time. And I guess it's, uh, it's uh, a nice lesson uh, done in, in, in developing countries. And uh, I will share it with you now. This is my uh, points for stress. Uh, time is brain and the obstacles for reperfusion therapy in Egypt and the action plan which we took to improve the acute stroke management. I guess we all agree that, as Mohammed was even saying in the introduction, that it's very important to watch the clock is ticking and Dr. Ishfaq also that the issue of imaging is watching that the brain is, as the time goes on, there is more and more damage to the brain for each minute we are losing in a stroke patient almost 2 million neurons, 14 billion synapses, and so on. And even in, in every second will count. Uh, that's why we are always stressing on the fast for the population and for the primary care physicians and for all people who are likely to encounter stroke patients to dispatch those patients immediately to a stroke service facility. And also the issue of triage is very important. That's, that's why triaging the, those patients are even 
now moving to the pre-hospital triage in order to save time. Saving time means saving life and saving neurons and improving the outcome of the stroke patients. But is thrombolysis and uh, thrombectomy is very effective? Both techniques are very effective. Yes, they are very, very effective. For example, the number needed to treat in the first one and a half hours is four to five. That's, this means that we are saving one patient from every four patients. And even in the worst uh, time, which is three to 4.5 hours, the number needed to treat is 14. These numbers are actually, they are very good because if we compare it to the standard technique in cardiology like primary PCI, we can see that in this meta-analysis, the uh, number needed to treat is 33. And even this number is sometimes lower in thrombectomy. Uh, in, in many studies, it's even less than three. Now I will move to the issue of the burden of stroke in Egypt and how we could manage to improve this. Of course, we all know that the stroke incidence declined by 40% in the past four decades in high income countries, but it doubled in the rest of the world in, in the developing countries. And in Egypt, it's the situation is the same. It's almost now the second cause of death with a prevalence of about one to two million persons. Uh, you know, of course, for example, in the States now, it's the fifth cause of death. Uh, that's why we are stressing that still stroke service is not very good in uh, my country. The estimated number of patients per year in Egypt might reach uh, 20, uh, 270 uh, thousands. Of them, at least 75 thousands are left with morbidity, severe morbidity. The first dedicated stroke unit was established in 1991 at my university, Anshans University Specialized Hospital, located in the northeast part of Cairo, with catchment area of almost 5 million people. And actually, I was a resident at that time, and it was uh, with a protocol led stroke service, more than uh, 60, 600 patients per year. That was a good start. This is before the era, of course, of um, thrombolysis. And this is the photo of my unit. And now we, and, and we, a few years later, we added in, in, an, in another uh, hospital, uh, also in my university, another stroke unit with 11 beds. And we started some experiences with the thrombolysis after the approval of the RTPA in 1997. Uh, was almost 14 or 40 patients. And at that time, this was some kind of a research, limited research, but the uh, rate of thrombolysis was very hectic and was very, very low. So before 2015, the situation in Egypt was, we have eminent physician, we have a long history of local research, but still, we didn't have limit, we have limited international publication, deficient documentation, no database, very limited uh, thrombolysis, intravenous thrombolysis, and almost no thrombectomy, with uh, no uh, Ministry of Health coverage of thrombolytic therapy. So we decided at that year, at this particular year, to study why the situation is like this. So just a very simple questionnaire, we did the study with a simple questionnaire, uh, addressing the issue of the causes of pre-hospital delay and in-hospital delay. The pre-hospital delay, to our astonishment, in, it's not the traffic. You know, Cairo is a very, very uh, busy city and with uh, very congested and heavy traffic, but the traffic, as you see, it's almost 10%, while uh, the main reason is lack of awareness. And when we come to the in-hospital delay, which is our main issue, because you know, of course, it's a pre-hospital delay, it's, uh, it needs a lot of work with the MOH and the media and the awareness and all these things. But in hospital delay, we noticed that in, 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 in those patients who are arriving in the window, only 13% were thrombolized. And this was very, very low number. And the reason why 
because the drug in most of the time is unavailable because you know the the drug because it's very rarely used so the hospitals are not keen to keep it and also the there is no logistic no path, pathway as dr ishfaq saying we have to have a written protocol a manual uh, algorithm a pathway and that was not present everybody's confused and when you go to the city uh technician, he will say, no, we, I, I will treat, I will manage with the uh, head trauma first to, to do the CT scan before the stroke patient and so on, you know, all these issues. So we decided to do an action plan to change this. The first thing is to make the drug available through donations. And we did a training program for the residents with the uh, whole algorithm, the pathway, and all things, and all these things, and it, it's, it became part of the training program for the residents uh, in neurology. And that was written in a manual, and every all the residents should know this by heart. You know, of course, all these details regarding the exclusion inclusion criteria and the breakdown of the door to needle, uh, and to be at least one hour, of course. Uh, less than one hour is preferable and all the residents should know this by heart and all the people also in the ER whether the nurses or the CT technicians and so on and there is algorithm also which was developed to our unit uh, deciding which pathway which will be taken uh, in the first uh, six hours or the first four and a half hours and so on and this was our manual which was written and even we started to use uh, simple uh, applications like WhatsApp. So residents can uh, also, if they are having a problem, they can consult with the senior staff or with things like this to uh, share their opinion and to know what to do in urgent situations sometimes. And afterwards, we did another study uh, uh, to know how we could improve the service through applying this Actually, to our astonishment, the number uh, of the patients thrombolyzed jumped to 95% instead of the 13%. And that was a dramatic change because of this uh, action plan which we had taken. And it was very important, of course, to publish uh, this experience in the International Journal of Stroke uh, to share it with the uh, uh, with other people. Another important step which we took forward, uh, at that time, uh, my dear colleague, Professor Magdu was uh, the head of the department and he took the file and uh, went to the Ministry of Health and convinced the minister at that time that this is very important drug and should be reimbursed. And the reimbursement of the drug was announced in a press release uh, in that year. And since that time, from uh, uh, actually actually was uh, reimbursed by the MOH across Egypt, and you can see how in even in in, in two centers in my university the number jumped uh, to hundreds of patients are thrombolyzed now, and even we started to do thrombectomy very frequently in in few years, four or five years. And Cairo University also uh, started, uh, you know, Cairo and the Enchamps is like uh, Real Madrid and Barcelona. So uh, they started to uh, build their uh, stroke unit and they did the biggest actually stroke unit. I guess probably in the Middle East, it's 40 beds with ICU uh, dedicated for stroke. And in our uh, society, the uh, Egyptian Society of Neurology, we have a, a dedicated chapter, which is the stroke chapter. And we had representatives from the different universities. And we started to cooperate together to uh, change the practice across whole Egypt. So we took our manual and we made some modifications uh, to be the guidelines of acute stroke management across all universities in Egypt and also in the MOH. And there was an important milestone, a milestone in, in the year 2017 uh, because we had the MENA stroke conference and this is the Minister uh, of Health and uh, he announced very important uh, 
decisions actually in this conference that that uh, establishing a national stroke committee and that st stroke units will be uh, uh, present in all newly uh, uh, built hospitals in Egypt and SITS, which is the most important international registry across the world, will be Egyptian National Stroke Registry. And these are the members of the uh, National Committee. Uh, me, Dr. Magda, the past uh, head of our department, and my dear two colleagues from uh, Qasr uh, Hospital, Cairo University. And uh, in the year 2018, we had another milestone, which is very important because thrombectomy was reimbursed. So now we can do thromb uh, thrombectomy and the patient is not paying out of his pocket if he arrived in the window. Again, just uh, last year, uh, the university hospitals, they have what they call the Supreme Council of University Hospitals. And we started uh, our society, the Egyptian Society of Neurology, the stroke chapter started to cooperate with the Supreme Council of the University Hospital to improve the stroke units in all university hospitals. So our goal is to uh, change the stroke units in these hospitals into a comprehensive stroke units to be center of excellence. And this is a, a big project also in collaboration with the Boehringer Ingelheim. So we have uh, three bodies uh, working together, the uh, Ministry of Health, the Supreme Council of the Universities, and the uh, Stroke Chapter of the Egyptian Society of the Neurology. And this is one of the meetings of the Egyptian Society, the, the Stroke Chapter. And, and actually, in the last meeting, we, we decided to have a section in the chapter for the interventional neurology. And also, we started to apply and uh, the tele stroke. And this is a very short video for only two minutes to show how we are applying tele stroke and connecting uh, stroke units uh, together. We need 500 stroke units in Egypt. We currently have 32 located in big cities. This gap leaves thousands of acute stroke patients in remote areas without proper emergency care. The major gap is not in equipment or drug availability, but rather in training and human resources. That needs to be changed. And this is where TREATS can help. The regional Ein Shams Telestroke Network. Using a blended online and on-site approach, TREATS employs telemedicine, training, continuous evaluation, and a central electronic registry. These components are used in a closely intertwined fashion to achieve our goals of leveraging the quality of stroke care in current network locations, as well as continuously adding new locations. These components also enable the network to provide optimum care for stroke patients in ERs, during admission, and even after discharge. We started by connecting Ein Shams University Stroke Unit to Ein Shams Specialized Hospital. And Ein Shams Obor Hospital. In Kafar al a government 140 kilometers north to Cairo, we helped establish a new telestroke location in Kafar al General Hospital. And then we went beyond borders to Somalia to help establish a new stroke unit in East Africa University Hospital in Bosaso. We hope that with your support, Treats Network can continue to grow and provide its services to more locations in Egypt and in the region. Treats, conquering stroke. 
also uh, the numbers uh, in the SITS registry, which is, as I mentioned before, the biggest international registry, it started to build. Now we, we approach it almost uh, 6,000 with more with 21 uh, centers enrolling patients in this uh, registry. And of course, with this with the dashboard of uh, the registry, this is, for example, from our unit, we can see how we are improving regarding the functional outcome uh, of the stroke and also regarding the door of to needle. We can see that all patients, for example, this year, less than one hour and even some patients less than 20 minutes. And also we, we manage it to be awarded through the ESO. This is uh, my dear colleague, uh, Hossam. He took the award a couple of years ago uh, in Gothenburg, uh, the Diamond Award. And I was awarded last year in Milan with the two Diamond Awards here. Uh, and my dear colleague, Hossam, was Prof. Valeria. And also I was taking my award. And even this year, we had uh, many awards. Uh, a newcomer, Tanta University, is starting to get award not only in Shams and Cairo University, but also other universities started to get awards. And another landmark, which is the, uh, we, we applied for the accreditation from the LGA group in Germany. And this is very important. And this was during the audit. Uh, and we managed to get the certificate for our two stroke units in Enshams University for the first time in Egypt. And also we were interested in doing international publications. That's why we started to publish to publish in many respectable journals, including Stroke, including Journal of Neurological Sciences, International Journal of Stroke and Brain Stimulation and so on. And this was actually our last publication, which was published in the Journal of Stroke uh, about the COVID time. So as we can see, it's a long journey and it's like a story, but I, like to share this story uh, with uh, uh, our colleagues to uh, explain how we could manage to change the okay. thank you thanks a lot our dear professor dr hani about that interesting story uh, which is fruitful uh, at its end and uh, still continues to the future uh, as a result of the great efforts in the past years between Ain Shams University and uh, other universities in Egypt uh, to improve stroke service and lower stroke burden in Egypt. Now we are moving to questions to our precious speakers and uh, I have question to Professor Dr. Helmut from Dr. Afaf Ahmed. Uh, asking, does the lower blood pressure can reduce prevalence of Alzheimer's disease? Yes, I saw this question in the, in the chat area already. Um, I mean, the, the, that's a very good question. Um, nobody can answer it, but um, let me put it this way. Um, it's very likely that there is vascular dementia, pure vascular dementia, and it's very likely that there's pure Alzheimer's dementia, but maybe the majority of demented patients um, have um, a mixture of both conditions. Uh, the dementia researchers say pure is rare. So um, if you have Alzheimer pathology, you may need to have additional vascular pathology in order to become demented and vice versa. So. Um, the studies that I was talking about did not discriminate between Alzheimer's and vascular. They just looked on cognitive decline. Uh, so you cannot answer the question from these studies, but I would say um, blood pressure lowering may not reduce the incidence of Alzheimer's disease, but uh, it certainly reduces um, dementia by um, acting on one part of the problem. That's the vascular one. But uh, Dr. Helmut, uh, uh, it was a pleasure to me uh, working with you uh, in the last uh, visit in uh, Medina. And I remember you gave me expression uh, status uh, lacunaires, 
we see a patient uh, com uh, complaining of cognitive decline. Yes. He was uh, uncontrolled blood pressure, uh, and we did for him MRI, and we found multiple small ischemic foci, and they gave us uh, the terminology of status, uh, like an uh, Do you think uh, if his blood pressure was controlled, would, uh, he wouldn't pass to that stage of cognitive decline? I think so, but it should have been done 20 years earlier. Uh, I have a question for uh, Professor Dr. Ashfaq from uh, Dr. Alisa Angolo from Lebanon. Uh, is there any applicable technological updates in BNM imaging that can extend the stroke window regarding mechanical thrombectomy? Um, yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, so, it, it is it's not so much um, technology um, than what your genetics you bring with you. So, if you have good collaterals, which probably is about twenty percent of the population, very good collaterals, then um, all all the technology does is. Uh, to find out if you're in that 20% or not. Um, to our practice, and especially if you're working in an area where you do not have uh, access to uh, um, perfusion imaging, for example, um, the clearest indication that you have got good collaterals is that if, if you know for sure that this stroke started 20 hours ago, right? So the stroke started 20 hours ago, and clinically you can tell that it's a cortical stroke. So they've got a speech deficit or neglect and visual field deficit, so it's a big stroke. And yet the CT scan looks very clear. That's your clue. If the CT scan looks good and the clinical exam shows a big deficit, uh, uh, this is something we, we, we call the clinical radiological dissociation. Then you need to do um, CT, preferably CT angio, to confirm that there is an occlusion that you can get to. So an occlusion could be in a distal M2 or M3, um, then you can't get to it, it's just too far. On the other hand, if it's in the tendon or the proximal uh, MCA, I would submit that you don't need much sophisticated imaging. The sophisticated imaging comes more, uh, becomes more useful not to a center that does thrombectomy, but to all those telecyte centers that feed into your center. So if you uh, uh, are a physician dealing with strokes in let's say 150 miles away from your thrombectomy center, and you have a stroke patient who has, uh, um, is 12 hours into a stroke and have a small core and a large penumbra, I think that's good enough that this is a slow progressive. Where the difficulty comes, and we struggle with that every day, is if somebody has a stroke and you're seeing them within the first one hour or two hours. At that time, it's very difficult to tell whether these are going to be fast progressors or not. So what I showed you, the HIR on that rapid um, pictures, the hypoperfusion index ratio. So if the lower the ratio, so let's say you've got somebody at, at one hour and has got a big deficit clinically um, and they have a small core and you want to know if this is a fast progressor or not, that HIR could help you. But that patient needs to be as a, I mean, it's more difficult to find in that patient whether their progression is going to be fast or not, as opposed to somebody whom you see at 10 hours or 12 hours. I, I hope I could express it to you. It's not about technology as much as how well you can use the existing technology. Yeah. Also, Professor Dr. Ashwak, uh, a question connected uh, to it. Uh, is there uh, upcoming guidelines regarding extension in the window of uh, thrombolytic therapy beyond the four and a half hour or even beyond six uh, hours, depending on the penumbra? 
Uh, yeah, that's a very, that's a very good question um, because uh, guidelines are as good as the place you work in. For example, you'd be surprised that I mean, there's been a big reluctance in the U.S. to go from three to four and a half hours, and yet the rest of the world uses a four and a half hour time window, right? So the guidelines are are guidelines. Um, what do you do? I mean, I I, I can invite. Uh, 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 Dr. Steinmetz into the discussion also, uh, what do they do in Germany? But in my center, we, we, we don't have a window. So if somebody, there's no time window. So if somebody comes in and this happens all the time, it's not rare. If somebody comes in within, let's say 18 hours of a stroke, the CT scan looks good. They've got a penumbra and uh, they have a small core that is not accessible to thrombectomy. We routinely treat them with TNK now. So, so yeah, I think your, your, your guidelines are very much dependent on where you live and how good your team is. And I'm, and I'm sure it varies from country to country. I agree, that, that's what we do too. We use uh, even TPA off-label um, imaging based. Of course, if, if we have an option for thrombectomy, we would do that beyond, beyond the four and a half hour window, but um, otherwise we'll do what you said. Yes. We have a question for uh, Dr. Haini Ayre from Imran Dio from Nigeria. Uh, is there in a story of success regarding improving pre-hospital notification in developing countries uh, you have experience in Egypt? We, uh, we are trying to work on this now. You know, the problem in Egypt is that most of the patients are not coming with the ambulance. <laughs> they are coming with uh, the cars of their relatives. So it's, uh, it's a difficult task, but now we are trying to make uh, an ambulance uh, network. So the ambulance will know to which stroke you need to go to. And I think this is our plan also to make such an awareness that if can uh, even go to which stroke unit nearby, because as I told you, and this is very difficult to change. Most of the uh, people coming to the stroke units actually are not coming by ambulance, but but, but they uh, relatives car. Okay, and this connected the question also from. Uh, uh, Dr. Shinto Malota in India, uh, is there in, uh, any recommendation regarding the public awareness campaigns about uh, timing uh, of uh, stroke window in order to be aware not to lose much time before coming to the hospital? Uh, that's our phase two, because you know, phase one was to improve the uh, pathway inside the hospitals and to build more stroke units. And actually, that was a debate even with the uh, MOH. Uh, can we make a public awareness program before building enough stroke units? So if you, know, if you did such an awareness, there will be a problem because a lot of patients will come to the general hospitals and they will not find the service. So I think they should go. We decided that we should go in parallel. Uh, doing the awareness in the same time, building more stroke units, either primary, uh, comprehensive, or uh, even telescopes. Uh, because, um, I mean, you cannot neglect this issue. It's very important to make uh, public awareness. Thank you. We have a question for uh, Dr. Helmut from Jawad Al Habadi. Uh, can we combine? Aspirin, Blavix, and the when? Yes, I saw, I saw that already on also on the, in the chat forum. Yes, of course we can, uh, and we should. In, in, the, in the patients with the TIAs and the minor strokes, um, there have been two studies, I, which I did not talk about because they were beyond the 18 month window that I was uh, checking. Uh, but the point and the chance studies certainly um, justify, and that's what we do too, to treat the patients for some time after a TIA or minor stroke, certainly not the major strokes, but to treat them with combination of aspirin and clopidogrel 
but no longer than let's say two to three weeks, but beyond that, uh, the, the, the harm exceeds the benefit. So we do it for two to three weeks. Okay. Also a connect, connect, uh, question to it uh, from uh, Abu Maida and Rahim. Uh, do you advise us to give a patient a tovastatin high dose, 80 milligram to achieve low density lipoprotein be, below 70? Uh, or we can add the zeta to reach that cardio. Well, I, we uh, just recommend to start with 20 and see how the LDL drops. Uh, and the aim is to let the LDL drop to 70 or lower. And we would not add acetamib unless we are, have reached an atorvastatin dose of 80. So. So, but, but that's individualized now. So you start with 20, then increase to 40, increase to 60, and see when the LDL target um, reaches its goal. Uh, I have a question for uh, Professor Dr. Ashfaq. Uh, in case from uh, Dr. Eliza Mitchell from Lebanon, uh, in case of no availability to do CT perfusion, MRI perfusion, uh, is filet image can help us in a wake up stroke? So, flare, yeah, so flare image, I'm assuming it's on um, MRI, right? So, yeah, yeah so, so, so flare, if you have flare, um, I would urge you to go back to your radiologist and get them to give you diffusion also. I mean, just another three minutes and almost, I am not aware of any. MR anywhere in the world that they would have a flare without a diffusion. Um, so th 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 that is something you cannot make a shortcut on. So I would really urge you to have your radiologist uh, invest a little bit in, in case the software is not available. Because the problem with flare, well, for, first of all, let me answer your question directly. The whole point of a flare diffusion mismatch was that if you start seeing um, if you start seeing abnormalities on flare, that probably indicates that this stroke is seven, eight hours or more in duration. Now that's not what you're treating, right? That's irreversible injury. What you want to treat is how much reversible injury there is. So in that wake up trial, the hypothesis, it was an excellent hypothesis, was a mismatch. So this tiny amount of flare was acceptable, but you needed to have a lot of diffusion injury, which was, I, I think it was very daring on their part to go, to go with that and assume that some of that was going to be reversed. So my answer, you need some work to do. Get your diffusion imaging. Um, but, but, but honestly, personally, uh, I think a good quality CT scan is sufficient. You, you really don't need to go to too much information. Get a high quality CT scan, understand yourself. If they're radiologists, they're going to kick me on what I'm about to say, but I'm so far away, they can't get to me. What I'm going to say is that most stroke neurologists can actually read a CT scan better than a radiologist when it comes to acute imaging. So acute imaging, looking for subtle findings of whether there's injury or not. So if you are in Lebanon, and if you want to give somebody TPA, and if you can read your CT scan well, that opens up your way for your TPA. I've always felt that you'll regret it if you don't treat, especially when you're in that, you know, four and a half uh, hour type, uh, time window. Beyond that, I'm sorry, but you'll still need a CT angio. At the very least, you need a plain CT and a CT angio. The rest of it is, you know, just makes our life easy. I hope I've answered your question. Yes, thank you. We have uh, a lot of questions, but uh, we will choose our last uh, questions to Professor Dr. Haney from uh, BD Enric from uh, Ghana. He asked in the uh, is there uh, any upcoming program for telemedicine uh, between uh, well-developed countries in the field of stock in North Africa and uh, developing countries in the middle of Africa? 
Uh, yes, we have uh, in our uh, university uh, a dedicated unit called virtual hospital. And actually we are utilizing uh, this unit or department to develop uh, satellite uh, stroke units, uh, telestroke units in different parts of Egypt. And they are cooperating with many regions already in Africa. I guess they are cooperating with uh, Somalia. And I guess also with uh, Ghana uh, and uh, Uganda. That, that's, this is, uh, I guess this is what I remember, but maybe they are also more engaged in, in, in other countries. Probably if he's interested, he can contact me and I will send him, uh, uh, I will connect him to the uh, Dr. Tamir. He's the one responsible for this project. Thanks a lot, Ibrahim, because that uh, interesting webinar to our eminent speakers. Uh, I hope we meet the uh, expectations of our audience from different parts of the world. Uh, and I will uh, take that chance to invite you to our uh, planned uh, virtual conference uh, near the time of World the Stroke Day at the end of uh, next October. Uh, and I hope to be events live, live uh, conferences but uh, if we are still in COVID pandemic, we will uh, move uh, through virtual conference and uh, hope you all to share our upcoming uh, virtual conference and thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you, our eminent speakers. Thank you, thank you, Professor Helmont, Professor Ashfaq, and Professor Hani. Thank you for our moderator, Dr. Muhammad. Thank you a lot, uh, uh, kindly all the participants, uh, you will receive, inshallah, link for evaluation. Kindly evaluate us to improve our service, to improve our webinars. Uh, thank you all for attending this webinar. Thank you.